Correct. Well, good morning. Now that we're all wide awake with a loud thing. Uh, before we start, I just want to let you know that this is going to be a very interactive panel. Um, so if people could just do that. Oh, yeah, we need 10 groups of people. So if you want to, um, Jeremy and, and, and Ryan, um, make friends. Exactly, make friends and make Get into groups of 10 and around people next to you. Um, three to four people in a group. Okay. All right. All right. Can I have that? Okay. Is that group? Yes. Okay. What we're going to do is a hypothetical. While they're still getting themselves going. It's going to be a hypothetical that we're going to go through um, and deal with ethical situations that we've all been in. You know, when clients walk into our, our office, whether they are prospects or current, or we, we need it to withdraw because of um, something ethical, unethical going on. So I'm going to read you the, the fact pattern. Um, and then the first question we as a panel are going to do, and then the rest, the remaining 10, will address to you guys. You talk amongst your, your group. Um, we want to hear what you think would be the right response as to how the attorney should have acted. Um, and then we, as panelists, will tell you what we believe should be done in accordance with the model rules. So, Sam is a citizen of India. He is 33 years old. He is a college graduate with a graduate degree from the University of Delhi. He majored in economics. Sam's parents reside in India. He is the only his only sibling, Tom, resides in Southern California. His brother is an entrepreneur and owns several businesses in Southern California. Sam wishes to visit Tom in the US. He has never visited San Francisco, but hears it is a great place. He decides he will visit his brother Tom. The timing for the trip is just right. He has been recently divorced and the divorce was messy. He needs some time to get away from India and clear his mind. Sam applies for a B2 visa at the U.S. consulate in India. He tells the officer he is visiting his brother for several days. He is granted the visa. On June 1st, 2017, he enters the United States as a visitor, B2. After three weeks, or mid late June, in the California sun and away from the stress of his divorce in India, Sam thinks it might be a good idea to permanently relocate and start a new life in the United States. He tells himself, why not live in the U.S., be close to my brother, and maybe advance academic studies at a U.S. university? He calls several colleges and universities while he is in the United States to see if they can have a degree program that fits his newfound academic interests in physics. He finds BCH University, which admits him to the university and offers him a seat at an upcoming twice semester class that starts in mid-October. His brother tells him that something needs to be done about his visa because he cannot study full time while on a B2 visa. On June 25th, 2017, he consults with a local attorney in San Francisco that dabbled in immigration law. <laughs> the attorney tells him that since your I 94 is valid for another five months, you can start studying, but just be sure to file a change of status from B2 to F1 before your current I 94 expires. <laughs> He leaves the meeting feeling grateful. He has options. He reaches out to the university designated school official, DSO. The DSO issues a form I-20, and he's ready to file a change of status for the fall semester. He starts taking summer courses for class credit immediately, unbeknownst to everyone. The first question is, um, and Angela, if, if you don't mind, answer this one. Sam has second thoughts about his advice to receive from the attorney, his interaction with the DSO, and he comes to you for a consultation. What do you tell him? Well, why did you go to that attorney that doubts, huh? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it was cheaper, right. So this is the um, 90 day rule panel. So I guess the first thing that we want to talk about is that um, the dates that you have just been read very quickly on this law school exam question is um, this was before the 90 day rule went into effect in September. So um, we're really talking at this point in this scenario about the 3069 rule. 
And he's probably violated his status and he's not going to like the, um, the advice that you give him at all, right? We all need um, to think about competency. So this is our, our ethics rule for the day is that competency is required and a lawyer shall provide competent representation to your clients requiring legal knowledge. Well, probably this uh, lawyer that advised him previously did not do that first rule, right? What do you think? Um, yeah, well, he went off and did uh, these actions probably on his own, starting this um, a university course starting his classes and violating his status. And he's kind of wound up in a bad place. So let's move on with, um, with the next part of the scenario. So as these, um, we answer, I'm going to keep adding more facts, and then we'll address the questions. So the first one, you know, after we read this, the next question is going to be number one. Um, so at the end of the consul consultation with Sam, he concludes that he wishes to, oh, at the end of your conversation, after you sat in front of my Angela, uh, he concludes that he wishes to file a change of status. He states, I need to file this change of status. Further, he states, I have paid you for this meeting, so you need to file for me. If you need more money, don't worry. We have it, and we'll pay you immediately. Please file. So, group one, yeah. the question is, what do you tell him now? I use, uh, hang on, hang on, hang on. I gotta, I gotta come to you. <laughs> well, first of all, as you know, we're speaking French, we're trying to tell him never ever to change the status in that situation, but um, he's going to have collateral consequences. On dead, they ever want to visit the United States? I don't know. Um, but anyway, um, so, so, so I think I would say, uh, has he signed a retainer agreement? No, he just had the consultation. Okay, well, first of all, he has to sign some type of retainer agreement. He's paid for your consultation. Doesn't matter. Okay. No. Yeah. I think rule number one you know, is, you know, unless you need an hour, like the consular officers yesterday about what they were doing. Um, get your money, get your, get your retainer agreement, and then start over. Daniel, if you could elaborate on what the model's rules. <laughs> okay, so this scenario calls into question two of the model rules. So, which is for 1.2 and diligence, which is for 3. <clears throat> this is outside of the scope of the consultation query. Jeremy said, yes, retained you as an attorney. <clears throat> so, just paying for a consultation is clearly not within the scope of you finally achieving your status. And it goes to diligence as well. In the fact that you may have had a brief consultation, but there may be other facts that you need to, uh, to find out. There may be other things that you need to do before you can file a change of status. So it would be inappropriate for you to, to do that without having to retain you as an attorney and being fully competent to file a change of status. Thank you. So the next piece is two weeks later, before a change of status is filed, Sam's mom gets sick in Delhi. He has to go see her. He departs the US. He stays in Delhi for several months. Sam decides in Delhi to get his F1 visa at the US Embassy in New Delhi. He applies on October 10th, 2017. So the question for group two is before he applies, he calls you and asks, Will I be all right? Do I have any risk? <laughs> Oh, yeah. Which one's group two? Thank you, Brian. <laughs> 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 you know, <laughs> right. so, well, in this situation, I have to say, um, if the lawyer is stateside, there's no way to get this in India. That'd be the first thing I go back to conference. Uh, it posts, but that one's a different. Uh, for example, the folks I primarily work at now, uh, F ones are very difficult to get at posts versus the post nearby that I spend a lot of time in. Is, it's not that it's difficult, but it's just uh, different. So that's one thing I'm going to look at. Is not, you should not be advising uh, someone uh, on an F1 if you never done an F1. And you certainly should be advising people on an F1 who have done an F1 out of the post. Like one thing? No, no, no. But you can't do that. 
Yeah. 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 Yeah.
In the hypo, we set the date so initially it was uh, before, before exactly. and at this point now it's after. All right. Moving on. The F1 visa was granted. He enters the U.S. as an F1 student. It's now been a year and a half later, and he's studying at BCH University, and soon, one additional semester, graduating from the physics program. He has not left the U.S. since beginning his studies. He does not want to leave the U.S. once he graduates. He thinks it may be, be, he thinks it may be good to work in the U.S. He applies for a pre-completion OBT. He does so. Tom is wealthy and has a successful business, so he keeps staying in the U.S., Tom decides that Sam should pursue a green card using the EP5 program. Tom decides to irrevocably give his brother 1.5 uh, million USD. Sam and Tom decide to make an investment in a new chain of fast food restaurants in Southern California. Sam invests his 1.5, and his brother, Tom, invests the balance needed for the investment. They are both shareholders in the business. Sam goes back to his attorney in San Francisco and informs him of the investment. The attorney advises him to file an I-526 and a petition by any entrepreneur. He prepares and files the I-526 with USCIS. A few weeks later, after filing, Sam travels to India to visit his mom and dad, who live in Delhi, while he's on break from his academic studies. He spends about three weeks in India and then comes back to the U.S. on his F1. When he comes back to the U.S., he finds that his pre-completion OBT application was approved, the EAD card was approved, and it has been delivered to his home. He begins to work part-time for the R&D firm that was listed by the DSO on his I-20 for his pre-completion OBT. So, three, the question is, is it okay for Sam to be working for this R&D company? Who wants it? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it's, it's a problem. The only possible issue is if you're saying, well, he came in on an F1, uh, with the 526 pending, uh, and therefore somehow there's no good attention. This is very standard. Uh, but the scenario you described is, is, is uh, a high percentage of EP5 cases. If uh, he legitimately came on an F1, even though he had a 526 pending, even though someday he may want to become a, a green card holder, uh, and legitimately coming on an F1, uh, he's able to work in an OBT position, so I don't, I don't see a problem. Yeah, I would add to that, though, that on the 526, um, I'm always very careful of the consular process, um, because if you put a just, I think that you know, you're, you're looking for a problem, um, with your entry on an F, but if you put a consular process, it shows that you do not intend to stay to adjust. So, we'll have that. Yeah, there's actually never a reason, in my opinion, on, on a 526, probably an I-140 to put adjustment, because no matter what you put, you can always adjust. There's nothing that prevents you from doing it. Uh, but if you put uh, that you're going to apply the consulate, it's consistent with, you know, if you were going to have an you're going to talk a little bit about E2s. 526 is pending, but it's perfectly consistent with the with something like the E2 uh, or with making an F1 entry. The fact that you said uh, that you're going to come to process your 526. Thank you. So you're both in agreement that it's okay to work for the R&D. Is that an ethical violation if the time stated to you that they ended up since? Uh, I believe what you know, what I would tell the client is that you shouldn't make have an intention right now. No one has an idea if or when you're going to be able to adjust status. If you're from China, you may be applying for adjustment of status in 15 years, uh, and uh, none of us has a crystal ball that goes out that far. So uh, it's certainly an ethical violation if uh, if we have a discussion and say, "Here's your plan. You're, going, you're definitely going to adjust status, but you're going to tell people that you're not." then you have a clear ethical violation. But simply the fact that someday down the road, you may decide to adjust status, and neither of us knows if that's going to happen. Um, I don't know, seriously. Thank you, guys. We really we agree with your, your expert opinions back there. And um, I don't know if any of you comment, but he went back to the Dandler in San Francisco for this I-526, so that, that might be an issue. 
there, you might check out that work. You know, um, as we were preparing for this, uh, we're, we're talking back and forth about the uh, last time you actually read the, the ethical rules, the model rules, and, and some of us uh, haven't looked at those since, since you were in law school, which tell me where are we? Yeah, yeah. And um, as your old AILA attorneys, we just like to channel Reed Trouts today and uh, advise you to look at the uh, ethics compendium that's on on the AILA Infodeck. It's an amazing resource. You all practice in all different kinds of states and, and over here, and I just um, advise you to take a look at um, the state um, resources that are available on AILA Infodeck and also the compendium. The compendium, I think the link to it will be on the Google Docs drive after this is over. And I've brought some handouts if anyone's interested in how it reads the articles. Thank you. So after three weeks with an R&D company, Tom is bored with his work. He does not feel sufficiently challenged. He wants another job to fill his time. He tells his brother about his boredom and says he needs a change. His brother says, why don't you start working for the company that we own? We just lost our top manager. He says that it, that's a great idea. He starts working for the corporation immediately as a manager. The question is, since his last enter in the United States in F1 status, it's only been 35 days. Are there any issues here? He comes to you and asks what he should do. What do you tell him? Anyone? Well, stop working at that job because it's not a physics job and it's not the job that is out of 20. Daniel? <laughs> he has no authorization to work there. It's not the job that's done for 20. And it's not, it is in his chosen field of study, so he cannot work for that company. It is in the field. He'd have to have the, have to have the it has to be on the I 20 list. So he'd have to have the I 20 and then to list the employer. The RD firm that he was working for is the employer of the Sonoma I 20. So in the field, he might be able to have the I 20 amended, but this is clearly outside of the field and it's done on the I 20, so he has no authorization to work. Is that like pre completion versus post completion? Yes. Yes. And the, the back matter question mentions that he's been in the U.S. for 35 days since his entry on an F1. I don't have a problem with the 35 days. In this, in this scenario, I don't think the timing makes any difference at all. The fact is that he doesn't have the authorization to work for the company. Whether it was one day after he entered or 90 days after he entered, the fact is that he doesn't have the authorization to work. How can you amend the I-20? You go to the designated school official. And you have to get a um, job offer from another another firm, and they could they could amend the other way. It, it would happen through the SEVA system and the designated school officials. Okay, you're talking about three hundred million. Three hundred million. You'll be able to get three hundred million dollars. Yes, he already has the conditions. Oh, got it. All right, so it's four months later now. Sam has been in a relationship with a woman in Southern California for the last three months or so. He thinks things are going well. She does not. That is this. Yes. They decide to break it off. Sam is devastated. His OPT is running out soon. His I-526 is not yet approved. He decides he needs a change of space and goes back to Delhi where he stays for two years. Two years later, Sam is still in Delhi. Sam gets a call from Tom that his I-526 has been approved and his priority date is current. He's excited. He still has a valid B2 visa in his passport, so he decides to get the next flight to California to see firsthand how things are going with his business and see if he can sort out his immigration issue in the United States and get his green card. He decides to fly for Abu Dhabi. Upon inspection and pre-clearance, he is thoroughly questioned. He is questioned about the I-526 and his intent. He tells the CBP, 
CBP officer that although his I-26 has been approved, he is just staying in the U.S. for a short period on his trip to visit his brother temporarily and then departing back to India. The officer believes him. He is admitted for six months. After catching up with his brother, Tom tells Sam that he needs to file papers to get his green card. He meets the same San Francisco attorney that helped him with the past, um, helped him in the past with the change of status, and that attorney tells him he needs to file adjustment of status application immediately. So the next question is: He comes to you for another opinion. What do you tell him? Excuse me, recording this. Anyone? Is he married yet? No. She didn't marry him. Yeah. Broke his heart. He went crying home to mom and dad. I think he needs a microphone. How do you get married on guys? Um that I mean the, the first thing uh, I see the um when he came in and he was interviewed by the officer in Abu Dhabi, that officer likely took notes and put it in the in the computer. Yeah. And so I would be concerned um, that whatever he said about not having the intention to adjust was already in the computer. So even if he waits the 90 days now, I would urge him never to adjust because he has already been flagged by CDP. And, and now I think they're putting together, you know, you always hate for a DOS, CDP, ICE, and CIS to be able to share information so fluently, which they're pretty much doing now. So I would urge him not to file for adjustment. You're almost at the end now, IV process. Just to add something to what Tammy said about sharing information, don't forget that DOS shares that information as well. So anything that your client has said to a consular officer during a previous visa interview, these are the CCD. When we were in Abu Dhabi meeting with preclearance, they were very clear that they have access to the CCD on the on the preclearance line. So they know what you tell the consular officer when you apply for your visa, and then they can make more notes in the system, which USCIS can see in an adjustment interview. So that information is all leaked, and it starts with the initial consular interview. Nice to so, yeah. Oh. yeah, I mean. I've seen sworn statements made from CVP, and that's why I've seen, you know, statements to CVP come back to haunt people. But uh, I haven't personally seen uh, notes taken by CVP. Have other people seen that? Yeah. Yes. 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 And and I have seen you know, someone saying do a FOIA, and I you may not find anything. Don't FOIA. Don't put my DOS hat on for a second. Don't FOIA the DOS. You're never going to get the notes for consular interview. You will get a copy of the DS 160 that the yeah. applicant found, uh, which is sometimes helpful if they don't remember what they said on the DS 160, but that's all you're going to get. Uh, but we do see the notes of the CCD come back to haunt people at CIS, and th there have been reports from the State Department Committee that people have been denied benefits from CIS because of what they said during the consular interviews that's come up in the context of H's and L's, where you, you said your job duties were X, and then upon um, the extension of the petition, CIS are issues in our theory that says you told the consular officer that these were your job duties, and this is not the petition. Absolutely, but I'm asking about statements to CBP that were not produced to a sworn statement. Sure, and those those are all the CCDs. Those are all the CCDs. Those, those are all the CCDs, so, so they, can, they can be seen by all of the other agencies. What are the new CCDs? Consolidated Consular Database. So that starts with the, the it's, it's shared by the three agencies. I'm sure other agencies have access to it, but the three agencies that generally make notes in the CCD are state, uh, CIS, and CBP. Um, but, um, I have a comment. Um, as a practitioner, though, um, whether you're here or you're back in the U.S. or wherever, um, I would always, in addition to advising clients, uh, hey, I'll, I'll FOIA you with um, CDC's in order, just in case. Um, there's the um, transcript that was bad question, mm -hmm. that I can't question the answer. No, it's 
power. Yeah. Oh, um, if you leave that question and answer, this is extremely helpful. And after that, if you know that certain um, representations were um, given as an attorney, um, you should decline because it's fraud. And you don't want to perpetrate a fraud on the same room, if that makes sense. That, that does make sense. And one of the comments I, I wanted to make and kind of bring this back to the ethics, this hypo suggested that the, the attorney that's dabbling um, advised uh, Sam to immediately file an adjustment. And I think that leads to issues of competence. You know, this, this lawyer is making a recommendation that could plainly put this client in trouble and, you know, diligence of researching the rules to be sure that the appropriate um, advice is being given. So we, we wanted to incorporate this kind of ethics piece of what this attorney was doing. I, I think there's clear violation here of competence and, and diligence. Um, is there a certain period of time where there is some sort of safe harbor? You mentioned your fact pattern, 180 days. I understand within 60 to 90 days, um, 60 to 90 days, you have to be careful about that. But does the rule allow for a change of intentions, change of circumstances after a certain period of time? After, say, the 100th day, yes, I intend to go back, but after 100 days, it's going to change circumstances. So it's it's not 180 days, it's 90 days. And that you, so the, the safe harbor, uh, sort of unwritten safe harbor provision that you're talking about is what used to be the case. But after September with the revised rule, it is any change of status within 90 days is going to be a red flag. And I say red flag because we heard yesterday from consular officers that they only really like to see whether or not if you've done something you absolutely shouldn't have done, and you, it's not necessarily an issue for them. They, they are only applying it in certain cases and where there's an issue of security, and it's generally just not being applied across the board. That might be the case, and we talked about this in our discussion yesterday, that might be the case for one consular officer from Manila who doesn't apply it that way. But we have to advise our clients based on the rules and based on the way they are written, not based on the anecdotal evidence that we hear that a consular officer in Manila told us they don't really apply it. And getting back to the, the evidence and the practice, if you advise a client, file a change of status immediately, and or if you wait 30 days and file a change of status because I know that after 30 days it's probably going to be okay. <coughs> The rule says 90 days, and if you, if you get challenged on that, and they say, my lawyer told me it was okay, and I waited 60 days, there was some grace period that my lawyer talked about, and he told me that consular officers don't really apply this, good luck, because you're not practicing. The rule, is, you know, the, the rule is written clearly, and I would hate to, to have my defense be a consular officer from Hong Kong told us that they don't really apply it that way, because I don't think that's very it. standard. But after the 100th day, 100 days has passed, the 20 days have passed, they want to do a change of status, and something has changed, then that's safe harbor. Yeah, and that, that is actually, that's something we're going to discuss, and that's it's actually getting out of the next question. Uh, since I. So, I just want to make one of So, we're, we're talking about uh, two legal issues, I think, uh, but there's also a practical issue. Uh, uh, I see the two legal issues are preconceived intent basis for denial. In a worst case scenario, it's a fraud issue, and we have a 212A6C. We kind of start you know, talking about both of those. There's also a practical side to this, which is now they're doing adjustment of status interviews on all of these things. So, in addition to all the legal stuff, the client needs to understand we don't really know how long a lot of these adjustments are going to take because they've added no people. Uh, and they want to adjust everybody to do interviews with everybody. So the client needs to understand in addition to all this other stuff. You're going to get a green card a heck of a lot quicker now by, by IB processing than you are by adjusting. Absolutely. And 
Sorry, I was going to say, the, I think these issues that we're speaking about could, could also come up at the adjustment stage. We're going to run into these problems down the road, and you can see as we go through this hypothetical, it kind of leads in that direction. Oh, so um, as ALA attorneys, so and might, this might be the next question on your pick was to stop me, but you know there's a lawyer across town we know is not competent. Sometimes people will come in to me for a second consultation. Sometimes I ask them who their lawyer is. <laughs> uh, okay, are they an ALA member? That's sort of like my basic question. I try my very best to never second guess another attorney. I don't think it's helpful for anyone. Um, but in this scenario, if the client is really pushing you to help with the adjustment because this other um, lawyer, would, would you ever pick up the phone and try to call that attorney? I'm just curious. I, I've never done that, but I'm just thinking like we are, we're, especially as seasoned practitioners, are we committed to try and help raise the bar? I really appreciate it when another attorney picks up the phone and talks to me uh, about the advice that I've given about the client sitting there in their office. And I think that in, in our chapter, there's not enough communication that goes on. It certainly never, never hurts. But I also know that there are some lawyers that I will never talk to in my chapter, right? So there are some that are just out there blatantly policing and, and committing fraud. So. So it depends. Now, I'm sitting here watching Tom counting his money here in the front row, and I think that he's getting on to the next, you know, he really wants to file this adjustment really bad. We're going to move on to the next. Yeah. It's going to take us a lot of money. So three weeks later, you got all of your money. Um, and after the conversation about the 90 rule, the previous integration issues, Sam understands the risks, but he wants to take his chances with the adjustment immediately. He rekindled his love with his girlfriend four years ago, and he is adamant that he's not leaving the U.S. He tells you to file the 45 packet since he no longer wants to work with a San Francisco attorney. So, yeah, you have Sam who has major issues. Well, they're not married yet, and he's pulled out all of his money to file this adjustment, and he's waited past the 90 days, and he understands what the Rule is and what the risks are. Um, and it's a FAM rule, and the USCIS may not be applying this rule yet, depending on when you get to this adjustment interview. So, as long as the risks are explained and he's willing to take the risks and it's past the 90 days, and he has pulled out all of his money and you have a good contract explaining the consequences. Um, you you uh, need to talk about what things are going to be, right? Yeah. Well, I want this thing filed quickly. Yeah. And so, in our discussions, Daniel says he's going to double the fees. Yeah. I mean, like, yeah, don't, don't you guys want to do this? Nobody wants for you to file it now. Drop all your other cases and, like, I want you to file the charge. Well, do you, well, how do you file a charge extra if the client says? Yeah, you're processing. Exactly, you're processing. You pay an additional free. So the factors on the reasonableness of fees goes to Rule 1.5, and that um, takes into consideration the time and the labor that's going to be required, the likelihood of um, uh, that you're going to drop other clients or move, adjust your workload, um, the customary fee in the in the locality. So we're taking a, everyone else does a premium fee, so I guess I can too. Um, the amount of time involved, the results, the limitations imposed by the clients when they want it done, you know, yesterday, um, and the experience and reputation ability of the attorney. So there's lots of factors on whether or not your fee is reasonable. So we may not want to trip on that. I don't know. It's got a pile there. So, but anyway. <laughs> All right, moving on. Somebody's going to tell me it's going to get dark. Oh, that's kind of, it's kind exactly. of cool. <laughs> can, you, can you take into account uh, if the client can like 
they're employment based. Is there payment to pay? If they're like an investor, you know, employment based and stuff. I don't think it matters to me. <laughs> <laughs> this is just not whatever you want. Right. Exactly. Right. I mean, so you're just gonna be like, okay, I'm only gonna charge you sixty dollars because that's all you got. No, I'm, not, I'm, not, no, I'm saying if it's like a, a Fortune 500 H1B that I know has larger financial resources rather than like the tap person consultant. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you yeah. I think what it means is, <laughs> and you nice. charge somebody more who's rich. That's what. Yeah. I'm saying. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> no, I, I think I don't think you can do that. And the one point five talking about collection of fees. Why not? If because you can charge somebody for less. Yeah. Why can't you charge somebody rich more? Because the fees have to be reasonable work that you're doing. So just because you're doing you work, do the same if work. you're filing an I seven sixty five for someone who is extraordinarily wealthy, or you're filing an I-765 for someone who's brought their domestic worker into the U.S. and maybe they, they're a very small, they have a very small amount of money. The work product is the I-765. It doesn't take you any more time. I think it's reasonable, I think it's reasonable to charge more money if you have to prioritize that work over your other work. But I don't think it's reasonable to charge more money just because of this. Well, I, I had this very, very wealthy client who about a year ago said to me, you're going to need to charge me more because I'm really high maintenance. Yeah, and I said, you know what? I'm going to charge you. 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 That's reasonable. That's the nice thing. That's reasonable that in that particular case. And that's an increased amount of work. So that is absolutely reasonable. The other thing I wanted to say is, despite the fact that that the state has this 90 day rule. The BIA case allowing um, a marriage case to adjust despite the fact that you didn't wait 60 days is still good law. Mm -hmm. And you can't just throw out a BIA case because CIS may, you know, some officer may think you violated the DOS 90 day rule. So we still have to remember that there's still published cases out there that support. A quicker filing action. But going back to, to Ron's point, if we're advising our clients to come to the process, the DOS applies the rule. So if if we're advising clients to come to the process because it's quicker, because it's more efficient, it's a DOS rule. And they will look at your entire history when you're in front of the officer and you know. So yes, I agree with you. We don't know, we don't know what's to come with CIS. But we know that DOS is instituting this rule, and as we do more and more constant processing, we need to be more and more mindful that this rule exists. Okay, I'm going to move on because I've been told for 10 minutes. So, you file the 45 you concurrently file the 765, five. you advise Sam that it will be 90 days before we can work lawfully in the US. He says, No way, I'm not waiting. I need to work for my company as we have just lost another top manager. I need to manage the restaurants. Who will the no, I'm working. I will not take a salary. He starts to work, but he does not take a salary. A week later, he calls you to inquire about his EAD. During this call, he tells you that he is working because he needs to keep things going with the restaurant, but there is no record of his employment. What do you tell him? It's a marriage-based adjustment? No. Oh, I so thought you said my son was Oh, okay. Okay, I got it married. Yeah. No, not yet. So, so, the, the only, so we obviously have somebody who is uh, working without permission, uh, which is the basis for a denial of the adjustment. Uh, and even worse than that, uh, if he's not admitting to it, he has a potential fraud. So uh, obviously, a good lawyer needs to advise him that he must disclose this on the form. And if he's actually worked it that, it's no longer a disclosure on the form issue. It's a you're not eligible for adjustment issue. So, Mark. Um, this is an immediate relative adjustment, if I. No, no, it's not. Okay, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. He's not sorry. He says a lot of dumb things. Yeah. No, he, he, he went back to her. I wanted to see, like, he made me run his own. She didn't like Yeah. 
Now, on the 485, where it asks about unauthorized employment, it speaks from the date of the signature. Right? Yes, it's correct. And it so yeah, one of the points that we wanted to make this part of the hypothetical is now you have a, a client that's becoming rather uncontrollable. You know, throughout this whole thing, this person has been making decisions that are contrary to the advice that you've been giving. And here, um, it looks like Sam is clearly not listening to what you're you're telling him to do. And this looks like it's going to be crashing into a brick wall rather soon. So one of the things we as kind of the panel were thinking about is saying, what does this lawyer do when you have this, this person that's so out of control and simply not listening to you? Is this a point at which you withdraw representation? Um, and you know, what is the scope of your representation? Can you have this person continually making these decisions that are clearly a violation of the law. And I, I think this is a point in time when any practitioner would need to think, do I keep representing this guy? He, he's clearly not listening to me. And I, I know in my own practice, I, I would have to have a very serious conversation with this person if I'm going to continue to represent them when they're not taking seriously any of the advice that I'm providing. This guy is working clearly without authorization and continuing to contact me and tell me that. Um, so I, I think this is like a really a decision for you. Yes, ma'am. What if uh, you had filed the adjustment and had the piece of money on file? Do you then withdraw it? Or do you say I had to withdraw because my client's going to hear everything on the letter and then go? No, I don't think you have to do a reason if you want to withdraw. And I, I think, you know, confidentiality. I'm not sure I think it may be from the other candidate. You know, and I, and I yeah. Okay, we're getting, we're getting, we're getting, jumping. <laughs> so, so a few weeks later, his EAD card arrives. He continues to work for his company. Finally, the date of the adjustment of status interview is upon Sam. He has decided to hire the dabbling attorney from San Francisco to attend the adjustment interview. He prepares it for the interview. He asks you what you should do, what he should tell the immigration officer about the work he has done in the U.S. You tell him that he should be honest and disclose that which he has asked by the adjudicator. You remind him about the 90 day rule, the past issues, and how these issues might impact him. At the adjustment interview, all is going well. Seems like they're almost done. The officer gets to the point at which past employment is discussed. The officer asks some pointed questions about Sam's work. They focus on the OPT and his employment with his corporation. Sam decides not to disclose information truthfully as he remembers the advice you gave him, which he did not follow, and how his previous actions could impact him. As his attorney, you're sitting next to him during the interview. What should the Dowling attorney do, and what should be done? Danny? What? So I think the, what would the Dowling attorney do? Correct. What would the Dowling attorney do? Not be a lawyer. Uh, probably nothing. Probably not do anything to correct what's being said in the interview. And just let the questions go to our OBT and hope that nothing else gets raised and, and just keep your mouth shut. Now, the other question is, what should the lawyer do? And surprisingly, nothing. Um, so the, the rules that are involved here are candid to the tribunal and confidentiality. And while there is a requirement to a candidate to the tribunal, it's trumped by confidentiality. And the exceptions to confidentiality are only when you know that your client may be committing a, a crime that will cause, in some states, death, and in, in, in others, serious harm, serious financial harm. None of that exists here. So the lawyer does not have an affirmative uh, duty to correct anything that is said by the applicant, whether, it's, whether it should be corrected or not. Uh, Certainly, if you were asked a question as a lawyer who's sitting in the interview, you have to answer honestly. But if the, the applicant is asked a question and they don't answer honestly, you do not have an affirmative duty to correct their statements. So. I, guess, I guess the affirmative duty is not to advance the fraud. In other words, you can't encourage answers that are helpful to your client. Um, I've never had it come up in an adjustment interview, but I have at the end of an individual hearing where, you know, 
what Judge looks at me and I say, no questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone knows what that means, but the judge said, well. Wow. I think the judge refer you back to the compendium and the, the hypotheticals that are in there, and then also make sure to go back to your state rules, whatever bar you are licensed in, refer to your state rules because there are variations. Um, and I really kind of appreciate Sal's position that you know, the crime, you know, the crime is being perpetrated on the on the tribunal. Um, that that would be the correct way to go. We have a, a local attorney who advises, uh, you know, what the consequences are of your answers, uh, what the rules are, and spells it out for the client, and then make sure that he taps his foot during the interviews, but it gets one of those sticky questions about whether you're answering yes or no. And these clients tell us that that's the advice that he has given, um, clearly perpetrating the yeah. yeah. a lot of our great papers. Okay. Just two more. Yeah. Sam's adjustment besides his denial. He promptly blames the lawyer. He wants to know his options. What do you tell him? Angela? Let's see. Where are we going? Sorry, I think we skipped a little bit. Did he did he get married yet? No. 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 Well, that's why I think. You probably want to tell him, like, hey, you want to get married now? Are you in love again? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think that that's where we're going with this, is that uh, marriage is back on the table. So at this point, where his um, adjustment of status is denied, um, if, if he is married, you really got to consider whether or not any of this is, is fixable. Is he eligible if he is married a U.S. citizen? Is he eligible for a waiver for fraud? I think that's the direction that we're going. Um, so. No, that's um, so now Sam is back in India. He's not trying to counsel process his approved 526. He's he called, like really to that. Yeah, no, he's just keeps going. He's like, I don't want to marry this woman, or either she's done it all. He calls you and asks you what he can expect based on his what, what has happened historically. You know? He's going to get to God. Um, his adjustment was his adjustment was denied because of fraud. Um, so he's got 212 A6C. Um, his entire immigration is being class. And I don't think there's any consular officer who's going to approve the, the consular interview, the consular application without a waiver. And unfortunately, there is no waiver. Based, there's no waiver of, um, of 212 A6C for an immigrant visa unless there is hardship, unless a qualified relative for hardship. So now we're back to Sam, I really hope you want to get married because his brother's in the US. But that's not a qualifying relative. The only thing he can do is get married. He's never going to get the immigrant visa application approved for the FIG6. So his option is, I hope that girl in Southern California wants to marry you. Uh, and I hope that she has some debilitating illness because you're going to be a pretty extreme hardship. But I think Sam's probably going to be a different point. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.